Uh, people magically go hushed at six o'clock, so it's probably time to make a start. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Those of you who are back for a second bite of the pie. Uh, some of you must have been here last night because you started turning up much earlier tonight to make sure you got a seat. So uh, it's good to see you. I'd like to just acknowledge the presence of the Chancellor of the University, Ian McKinnon, who's also a member of St. John's. So he has a foot in both camps that uh, this lectureship is intended to serve. Uh, my name is Chris Marshall. I hold the St. John's Lectureship in Christian Theology here at Victoria. And on behalf of the university and on behalf of St. John's, uh, let me welcome you to tonight's lecture, which is the second in our series of four. Uh, tomorrow's lecture, for those of you who are planning on going, is at lunchtime. It's at 12.30 uh, in Rutherford House downtown. So don't turn up here tomorrow at 7 because nobody will be here. So it's at 12.30 in Rutherford House. The theme of our lecture series is Migrations of the Holy, Challenging the Myths of the Secular Age. Uh, last night we talked about, or Bill talked about, the myth of religious violence, and tonight's lecture is on the myth of the free market. Our speaker, and I need to introduce him a second time, he'll get very sick of being introduced because I'm going to have to do it four times, but some of you won't have been here last night, so um, I'll have to do it again. But Bill uh, is the inaugural St. John's Visiting Scholar in Religion here at Victoria. He is professor of, uh, senior research professor at the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University in Chicago. As I look down to his name, William Bill Kavanagh, it sounds like a cowboy. <laughs> wow, Bill Hitchcock. He received his BA from Notre Dame University in 1984 and his MA from the University of Cambridge in 1987. He then spent a period working as a lay associate with the Holy Cross Order in a poor neighborhood in Santiago in Chile, and after which he joined the Center for Civil and Human Rights at Notre Dame Law School, where he worked on documenting stories of torture in Pinochet's Chile. He completed his PhD in religion at Duke University in 1996 under the supervision of the very well-known theologian Stanley Halwas, uh, who was famously described by Time magazine just after 9-11 as America's best theologian. Uh, several other more colorful epithets are used for Howell Wasp, but that's the one he probably uh, is proudest of. Uh, after teaching for 10 years at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, Bill joined the faculty at DePaul in 2010. His areas of specialization include political theology, economics, ethics, uh, and ecclesiology. He's published numerous and important books including Torture and Eucharist in 1998, Theopolitical Imagination in 2002, Being Consumed in 2008, The Myth of Religious Violence in 2009, and Migrations of the Holy, which is where we pinched the title for this lecture series from, which appeared in 2011. He's also co-editor of two um, readers in political theology, one by Blackwells and a very large one by Erdmans, and is also editor of the journal modern theology. His work's been translated into several languages and he has delivered lectures. I don't know how many languages you've delivered lectures, but in several universities around the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, throughout Europe, the Philippines, and now as his crowning achievement here in our lovely land. Uh, most of the time this requires him to leave his wife and two boys behind, so we express our gratitude to them for releasing you. If in the first decade of this uh, millennium, I guess this century, in the wake of 9-11, our headlines were dominated by news of terrorism and religious violence and the war on terror, which lay behind last night's lecture, then the second half of the decade has been dominated by news of the global financial crisis and financial bailouts of eye-watering dimensions which doesn't mean that the violence has gone away, it just means it's not quite as newsworthy anymore. Bill is going to talk tomorrow on the global financial crisis in more detail, but this evening he addresses the question, just how free is the free market? So please welcome him to the podium. Well, thanks again, uh, Chris, for that kind introduction. And uh, thanks again to my hosts, thanks to the Chancellor for coming out tonight and uh, for all the people that have made me feel so uh, welcome 
uh, here in New Zealand. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful 48 hours so far, and I, I look forward to meeting uh, more of you here. For those of you that were here uh, last night, I salute your masochism for coming out a second night, and I hope not to let you down. Um, I, I just want to say one word of appreciation for Chris. I hope you appreciate um, what you have here in Chris. I just finished uh, reading in manuscript his new book on restorative justice, and it's really an excellent uh, book. So run right out and order it. Don't wait to see the movie. Um, it's, uh, it's terrific. Um, so tonight I want to talk about um, uh, the myth of the free market and this is one of those um, uh, kind of uh, truisms that, that uh, towards which we all are expected to bow, that the, the free market has triumphed and that um, uh, uh, the free market is to be um, uh, uh, preserved from interference and so on. This um, last night's lecture uh, was more political, and these next lectures are going to be more economic, and I s suspect that in some ways uh, the economic lectures are going to be more uh, relevant to the New Zealand context. This, the sort of ideology of the free market, I imagine, um, uh, is the kind of um, ideology that was behind the uh, free market reforms in New Zealand from the 1980s and onward. So I think uh, perhaps we can we have some uh, uh, um, uh, points of connection there. So um, I want to talk about. Uh, the ideology of the free market in terms of the current economic chaos that I'm going to talk about in more detail tomorrow, but um, the current economic chaos kind of provides us with an opportunity to reconsider questions of freedom and power in the free market system. And what I want to look at is two prevalent attitudes in, um, the, towards the free market today. One that we are living in an age of limitless freedom. Barriers to uh, the free markets are crumbling. Unparalleled opportunities are opening up behind, before us. Um, the, the specter of communism has been defeated and so on. And on the other hand, there's this prevalent feeling that we're subject to market forces beyond our control. And this manifests itself in this sense of powerlessness in front of this tremendous system. Uh, things happen in Greece and Spain, and suddenly people are thrown out of work here halfway across the world. And there's a sense in which there's something much larger than anybody's control. And panics have this kind of rippling uh, effect. People lose their homes because of exotic things like credit default swaps that we don't even understand. People feel besieged by marketing. It comes up everywhere. Um, in one of the latest uh, marketing blitzes to support one of the Disney movies that came out, there was an article about the marketing in the paper, and one young, mother of a young child was quoted as saying, it drives me crazy because you can't escape it. And it was an interesting comment to make in a free society, in a free market. It drives me crazy because you can't escape it, right? Uh, Dilbert cartoons um, have this sense that there's something about uh, white collar life that um, that is is restricting. We hear stories that our shoes are made by child labor making 30 cents an hour and we feel like there's nothing we can do. So there's this prevalent sense that there's something much larger that's beyond our control. And I'm wondering if these two attitudes are related in any way, that we're living in an age of limitless freedom and on the other hand we are subject to these market forces that are beyond our control. And here's my thesis. My thesis is that these two are intimately related. In the free market worldview, freedom means doing what you want. There are no common ends to guide what each person wants. And in the absence of common ends, all there is is power, the sheer arbitrary power of one will against another. In other words, you want what you want, I want what I want. There's no objective standard to say one want is better than the other. That's what we call freedom. 
But if there is no standard to say what one, that one want is better than another, the one with the most power wins. That's my thesis about how these two things are related. So I'm going to look to start out with at free market ideology, and I'm going to look at one of the classic um, proponents of free market ideology, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman came and visited uh, Chile under the Pinochet regime. Uh, he had an enormous influence throughout the world, and perhaps, I, I don't know if, if he had influence here or not, but um, he was one of the important uh, uh, drivers of the liberalization of markets in the 1980s and beyond. Now, according to Milton Friedman, a market is free if exchanges are bilaterally informed and voluntary. What does that mean? First of all, informed, there's no deception involved, right? That um, uh, you're selling a house and uh, it, there's no termite problem that you haven't revealed to the buyer. And secondly, the price transmits only the information that you need. Your pencil is worn down to a stub. You need to buy a, a new pencil. You don't need to know where the wood comes from, how it's harvested, etc. You only need to know that the price has increased, and so you're going to wear your pencil down to a stub before buying another. That's uh, an example that, Fr that Friedman uses. You don't need to know where pencils come from. You just need to know it costs more, and so I'm going to hold on to this one uh, before I buy another one. That's informed. You just need to know the price. Secondly, then, it's free if it's voluntary. So there's no external coercion involved. There's no state coercion especially. So government uh, influence, Friedman says, uh, needs to be um, taken off in order for a market to be free. And people get what they want, right? Friedman says a free market economy gives people what they want instead of what a particular group thinks they ought to want. Underlying most arguments against the free market is a lack of belief in freedom itself. Okay, a lack of belief in freedom itself. And so there's no agreement necessary on what is desirable here. People just need to get what they want. So you want rosaries and I want wrestling videos and as long as we're getting what we want, then the market is free. So freedom itself is pursuing whatever you want without interference from others. Now, there's two presuppositions then that come along with this. The first presupposition is that freedom is defined negatively as the absence of external interference. Okay? So freedom is what exists spontaneously in the absence of coercion. Freedom is, in, is agnostic about the positive capacities of each party to a transaction. For example, how much power each party has at his or her disposal. To be free, it suffices that there is no external interference. And secondly, there's no common ends, right? Everybody is free to choose their own ends. There's no objective standards for a good want and a bad want. Friedman thinks marketers don't create wants, they just respond to what people want. He said that it's much more efficient to appeal to what people really want than to, to try to artificially create desires. So he doesn't buy the argument that marketers create desires. Where do wants come from? Well, Friedman says, I don't know and I don't care. It doesn't matter, right? It just matters that you have them. Okay. Now I'm going to take a look at those two presuppositions and examine them from a Christian point of view. And I'm going to go all the way back to St. Augustine. I love doing this in my classes. I have classes read uh, Milton Friedman and St. Augustine side by side to see what the attitudes towards uh, freedom are. And then we always play a little bit of Janis Joplin, right? Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. So we'll see who's right, if she's right about that. In the Christian tradition, freedom is defined positively and not simply negatively, right? Um, negative freedom, the freedom from external interference, is a necessary but not a sufficient 
uh, um, presupposition for freedom. Freedom has to have, you have to have a capacity for something. It has to be a positive. It's not just freedom from, it's freedom for. Let me give you an example of that, right? So playing the piano. If somebody, if there's a piano there, there is a piano there. Hey, this is perfect. Um, and somebody says, you're free to play that piano. Um, I, I would say, great. It means that there's nobody stopping me from playing that piano. There's no negative interference, right? The problem is, I don't know how to play the piano. Right? So in order to play the piano, I have to have negative freedom, and I also have to have positive freedom, meaning the capacity to play uh, the piano. So the distinction between positive and negative uh, freedom there. This comes out uh, very strongly in Augustine's famous uh, battle with the Pelagians. Pelagius and his followers thought that you can't make sense of heaven and hell unless you simply have the freedom and the capacity to either choose good or choose evil, right? This is, this is kind of standard what, what you might get from, from students and so on, right? You stand in front of choices, you make good choices, you go to heaven, you make bad choices, you go to hell, right? And it's kind of up to you. Augustine thought this was wrong because it basically means you can save yourself, right? The Pelagians thought that freedom is freedom from external interference. But freedom, in Augustine's view, is much more complex than that. It's not just the absence of external interference. It's not just a negative freedom from, but a freedom for, a capacity to achieve certain worthwhile goals. All of those goals are taken up into the one overriding telos or goal of human life, which is the return to God. And so Augustine thought that freedom is being wrapped up in the will of God, not simply asserting one's own will over against God or anybody else. God is the condition of human freedom. Being, then, is not autonomous. All being participates in God, which is the source of being. So aut autonomy, Augustine thought, is in the strict sense impossible. To be independent of others and to be independent of God is to be cut off from being and to be nothing at all. So to be left to our own devices, to be cut off from God, is to be lost in sin, which is the negation of being. For the Pelagians, in order to be convicted of sin and rewarded for righteousness, Human freedom must, in some sense, be external to divine grace, right? Otherwise, how could God blame us for doing what we do? Freedom for the Pelagians was a kind of human power, and sin is an exercise of that power. Augustine, on the other hand, thought that sin is not a power, but a weakness. It's a lack of power. Augustine uses the metaphor of slavery, or sickness to discuss the nature of sin. In his confessions, he says of his own condition before his conversion, he was bound not by an iron imposed by anyone else, but by the iron of my own choice, right? Bound by the iron of my own choice. So sin, he thought, is not subject to free choice, properly speaking. So the alcoholic with $20 in his pocket and an open liquor store is free in the negative sense to get what he wants, but in the positive sense, he's profoundly unfree. He's enslaved to his addiction uh, in that sense. So to regain freedom for the alcoholic is not to leave the alcoholic alone, right? He could only be free by being liberated from false desire and moved to desire rightly. And this is the sense in which Augustine says, Quote, freedom of choice is not made void, but established by grace, right? It's not God interfering, but it's God establishing freedom through grace, since grace heals the will whereby righteousness may be freely loved. Freedom is something received and not simply exercised. Let me say that again. Freedom, in Augustine's view, is something received and not simply exercised. And so what you have here is a fundamentally different view of desire than that held by Mil Milton Friedman. Augustine doesn't assume that individuals simply have wants that are internally generated and that subsequently enter the social realm through acts of choice, nor does he assume that desires are simply real because people have them. 
nor that one, what, what one really desires is fully transparent and accessible to one's own self. There's a, a, a psychologist at Harvard now named Daniel Gilbert. You may have heard of him. He's done all kinds of empirical investigation into this question. And Gilbert says, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones say you can't always get what you want. Gilbert says what he's found in his experiments is that you can't always know what you want, that we don't really know what we want, and that we're constantly misjudging what will make us happy. And so Augustine kind of anticipates this uh, in a kind of non-empirical way 1,600 years uh, before Daniel Gilbert. For Augustine, desire is a social production, and we don't necessarily know what our deepest desires are. Desire is this kind of complex and multidimensional network of movement that doesn't just originate within the individual self, but pulls and pushes the self in different directions, both within and without the person. Desire itself is not simply transparent to us mortals whose bodies are these battlegrounds of competing loves, right? I mean, I watch my own children and watch how they're kind of um, uh, uh, taken by, by culture in good and bad ways, uh, good and bad influences. And their, their bodies, their desires, just like my body and my desires, are kind of battlegrounds of different, different sort of forces that are pulling in different directions. Um, so I think Augustine, in some ways, is much more, um, has his finger on what human beings are really like more than Milton Friedman. In other words, I think Augustine is not just right theologically, I think he's right factually. I think his presentation of what human beings are really like is more accurate than Friedman's. Okay, that was all that, sorry, was the first presupposition about uh, freedom. Now I want to talk about ends. Um, all of this indicates that there are true desires and false desires, and we need a, a telos, a goal, an end, to tell the difference between them. Whether something is free or coerced depends on objective ends. In other words, it's not enough to say that someone is doing what they want without interference. The real question is, is what they want a good thing or a bad thing? Right? Is the alcoholic wanting something good, and is it therefore free or, or not? Um, and this is what Augustine, when he was dealing with the Donatists, um, I'm not going to go into that in much detail, but that's what he says. The whole question is whether schism be not an evil work. And sometimes Augustine thought that you needed to coerce people into the good, and I don't think that's such a hot idea. Right? He thought that the Donatists could be beaten with canes in order to bring them back into the fold, and I don't think that's such a good idea. But the larger point I think he was right about, and the larger point is that we need desperately not to be left to the tyranny of our own wills. So whether or not it's coercion in a negative sense depends on whether the will is being moved towards something good or something bad, right? The key to true freedom is not just following whatever desires we happen to have, but cultivating right desires. So the point finally then is this, absence of external force is not sufficient to determine whether or not an exchange is free. We have to consider the ends and have an objective standard for determining what's, a, what's good and what's not. We must be able to answer what really makes a person free in order to say whether a market is free or not. So I think that there's no sense in either blessing or damning the free market as such. The real question is, when is a market free? And in order to answer that question, you have to have some sort of objective standard of good to which to appeal, even if we don't all necessarily agree on what that standard is. Now, what happens when there is no objective standard, no objective ends? And that's the case in our society, at least ideally in, in free market theory. In a recession, right, we're told to buy stuff. It doesn't matter what, just consume, right? Desire itself becomes the end. And yet Augustine says desire for objects cut free from their source and end in God is ultimately the desire for nothing, right? Um, Bruce Springsteen has a great song called 57 Channels and Nothing On, right? Um, 
everything is available and nothing matters. Uh, in, uh, that's that's a, a, a dynamic in our society. Um, because choice itself is the only good, because desire is the only thing objectively desirable, then desire becomes a desire for nothing. Right? People go and buy something and then it turns into a nothing and they've got to kind of go out and buy something else. Even if Augustine is right, though, about the need for objective ends to guide the will, the question then that pops up is who is to say what those ends are, right? And there's no doubt you could take Augustine's view in a very paternalistic direction, right? We know what you really want and we're going to organize society in this way. Um, and, and Friedman was right to reject that kind of planned, centrally planned economy, I think, right? I have no thought at all about endorsing a centrally planned kind of communist, socialist uh, economy in that sense. Um, however, so, so the, the free market ad advocates are right about that. Um, they'd rather that individuals make their own mistakes, that some will make bad choices is inevitable, and Friedman will admit that, but it's better to give individuals the freedom to damn themselves than to subject everyone to a power that is no more guaranteed than any other individual will to choose well, right? So they're right about that. And nevertheless, the idea that this type of economy that we're in is free is also problematic. The problem with the free market view or ideology is that it assumes that the abolition of objective goods provides the conditions for the individual will to function more or less autonomously. The reality, however, is different. Wills don't operate autonomously. They are within these fields of power that are out there. Augustine sees this clearly. The absence of objective goods doesn't free the individual, but it leaves it subject to the arbitrary competition of wills. In other words, in the absence, let me, so in a, uh, in a free market worldview, freedom means doing what you want. There are no common ends to guide. So in the absence of common ends, all there is is power, the sheer arbitrary power of one will against another, right? This is Nietzsche, um, to put a, a name on it in the sense. This is what Augustine calls the libido dominandi, the lust for power, sheer arbitrary power. If there is no objective goods, then it's just my will against your will and the one with the most power wins. Persuasion can only be coercion if there's no objective standard of what's good. So the will is moved by greater force and not by any intrinsic attraction to the good. So now what I'm going to do is talk about how power then actually works in our economy. And I'm going to talk about that in four different ways. I'm going to talk about marketing, about limiting consumer choices, about power over employees, and, um, and state power to enforce free markets. And so I'm going, to show, I'm, going, I'm going to show that, in fact, what we have is not autonomous wills pursuing their own uh, desires, but people being moved by powers that are much greater than themselves. Uh, the sense that I talked about at the beginning of being subject to these much larger powers that we have no control over. So I'm going to give four examples of that. First of all, marketing. Marketers know that when there's no agreed good, sheer power remains and they're pretty unsentimental about it. Right? It doesn't matter if it's poetry or pornography, if it's good for people or good for the environment. What matters is that you sell, right? Richard Ott's marketing textbook, Creating Demand. The introduction is all about the, the consumer is king, and the rest of the book is how to manipulate people into buying what you want them to buy. It's really amazing. It's not an isolated example either. Businesses expect more for, than for their billions of dollars in marketing expenses than the mere purveying of objective information to the consumer. They assume that they get something for it. And in fact, most contemporary marketing is based not on providing information. So all the stuff that, that uh, Friedman talks about information, most of it is not directed towards providing information at all, but on associating products with evocative images and themes that are not directly related to the product itself, right? So the, the, the people in bikinis 
frolicking on the beach uh, selling soda. They don't actually say anything about the fizzy orange liquid in the can, right? It's just the association of that with, with good times and so on. Non-commodifiable goods, I'm going to do a whole history of marketing on uh, Thursday's uh, lecture. Non-commodifiable goods such as self-esteem, love, sex, friendship, success, and so, and so on, are associated with products that bear little or no relation to these goods. The desire for these goods is intensified by calling into question the acceptability of the consumer with the General Motors Research Division in a memo that was leaked once called the organized creation of dissatisfaction. Isn't that a wonderful phrase, right? The organized creation of dissatisfaction. They were talking about changing car models every year, um, which is not, strictly speaking, necessary. This shift in the 20th century from product-oriented advertising to buyer-centered advertising has been extensively documented, and it's recognized not just by critics, but by the advertising industry uh, practitioners as well. As one marketer promises, advertising creates emotional bonds between consumers and products. He says it is about, quote, creating mythologies about brands by humanizing them and giving them distinct personalities and cultural sensibilities. Now, this doesn't work like a, a lobotomy, right? Friedman doesn't think it works at all. He thinks people prov marketers provide information and then you choose, right? Um, he, it doesn't work like a, robotom a lobotomy. We're not robots. It's, uh, Michael Buddy likens it more to playing poker against somebody who can see your hand, right? Um, maybe in a blurred mirror. Um, uh, the, the, the power relationships are, um, are, are stacked uh, against you. Um, here's what Omnivision a consumer intelligence service that harvests data says, quote, we think we know more about your own neighborhood than you do, and we'd like to prove it, right? Um, there's also the phenomenon of just the saturation, what one observer calls an almost total takeover of the domestic informational system for the purposes of selling goods and services. We are marinating in marketing what the record reveals is almost to there's there's the quote Herbert Schiller, uh, some examples, right? Um, this is one that uh, that's fairly new, um, advertising on the top of uh, gasoline pump handles. Your message here. Do you have that in New Zealand? No. Lucky, not yet. It's coming. Um, those little dividers in the grocery store between your groceries and the next person's groceries, are those covered with advertising here? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> how about this one? <laughs> Urinal cakes. Uh, some of you uh, would recognize that. Ooh, I didn't even notice, but it changes. Wow. <laughs> how did that get it? That's amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of a Luddite. I don't. I still don't. I think still think the internet is run by little uh, um, pixies and computers or something. Um, tray tables in uh, uh, airlines, uh, in airplanes now uh, are also covered with advertising. Everywhere you set your eyes, um, advertising uh, pops up. Some estimates uh, are as high as uh, 3,000 advertising images a day that we set our eyes on. Um, and to think that, uh, as Friedman seems to, that the consumer simply stands apart from such pervasive control of information as to engage, I think, in fantasy. And in part, it works because we think it doesn't, right? We, we all think advertising works on other people, and it doesn't work on us, right? And there's even a, there's a whole genre of anti-advertising advertising, right? Uh, sprite, uh, image is nothing, obey your thirst, and so on. Um, so it works because we think it doesn't. It works subconsciously and not consciously, and this is something that um, Leo Burnett and others discovered in the mid-20th century. Um, Secondly, then, uh, besides the pervasive uh, nature of marketing, uh, there's the, the phenomenon of large conglomerates limiting consumer choice, the homogenized chains that shut down small uh, businesses. 
uh, things like Walmart kind of in the United States shutting down uh, Main Street uh, businesses, the big Walmart and then the hometown Main Street businesses go out of business. Sam uh, Walton was very deliberate about this. In the early days of Walmart, what he would do is move into a town uh, depress the prices for hardware in his stores until the hardware store went out of business on Main Street, bring those prices back up, depress the, the um, prices for, you know, pharmacy or whatever until the drugstore in town went out of business and so on. Um, and so uh, uh, some people, so, so there's a, a, a way in which um, uh, the homogenization tends to, to restrict our choices rather than um, add to them. There's also a way in which um, the, the, the larger um, the businesses are, they, they tend to absorb the smaller businesses and it becomes a shell game. There was um, Miller Brewing Company in the US used to do an ad campaign that touted macro brew. It's time to brew, uh, to drink beer made in vats the size of Rhode Island was the, the slogan. And then at the same time you had the Plank Road Brewery with a couple of people sitting, a couple of old fellas in overall sitting around a warehouse talking about you know how small their brewery is and so on. And then you've got the Line and Kugel Brewery where the Line and Kugel family talks about how it's been in the family for generations and so on. What you didn't see is that Plank Road and Line and Kugel were both owned by Miller, which in turn was owned, is owned by a huge South African conglomerate. And so it all kind of ends up, you know, small breweries, big breweries, it all kind of ends up in the same place. Third example, power over employees. Here's some statistics from the US. In 1980, the average CEO made 42 times more than the average worker. In 1990, it was 109 times. By 2004, it was 430 times more than the average worker. And I think uh, the, I, the statistics have increased uh, since then. And the phenomenon then on the other end, of course, in outsourcing and globalization is often the depression of wages to very low levels. Um, I had, um, actually I couldn't find it, but I have an advertisement which was actually put out by a U.S. government agency um, in a, a textile uh, trade magazine. And it, was an, it, was, it showed a, a Guatemalan woman um, like this, sewing at a sewing machine, and it said, Rosa Martinez makes garments on her sewing machine in Guatemala for U.S. companies. You can hire her for 33 cents an hour. Right? This was being put out by a U.S. government agency actually encouraging people in the 1980s, uh, I'm sorry, the 1990s to uh, outsource. Now, why do managers do this, not just because they're evil, but because they feel coerced. They feel that they have to because their competitors are doing it. If we don't keep labor costs down, the price of the product will rise and people will buy someone else's product. And so it assumes that consumers seek power over workers by simply seeking low prices, right? And meanwhile, managers seek power over consumers and workers in order to keep the prices low to appeal to the consumers. But there's a sense in which nobody wants to do this, but everybody feels compelled by the free market. And that's one of the ironies of the free market is the sense of coercion and compulsion that comes along with it. And you'll hear managers saying this, you know, we didn't want to shut down the plant here and move it to China. We're not bad people, but we feel compelled to do this by market forces, these larger forces that are beyond our control. Um, meanwhile, stockholders uh, seek power over managers and workers to keep stock prices up and offering stock options to executives has been the favored tool for ensuring that the interests of the executives and those of the sh stockholders coincide and as a result of this shift of power, executives have strong incentives to favor the concerns of stockholders over those of employees and the communities where they live. So who owns the corporations? A question on which Friedman is agnostic plays a crucial role in the dynamic of power. And then fourthly, 
um, state power. Uh, uh, here's a quote by Edward Galliano about the era in the 1970s and 1980s where military dictatorships were taking over um, in South America and enforcing free market reforms. Uh, that's when I'd, I lived in Chile in the 1980s and that, that's what was happening there. Galliano is a Uruguayan and his quote was, people were in prison so that prices could be free. And that's uh, um, a, a dynamic that we see over and over. Um, the main point, again, uh, there's uh, a scene from Chile, the coup in 1973. Um, the main point is this. In a supposedly free economy, there are no objective goods. But the, if there are no objective goods, all that is left is sheer power and the coercion of wills to arbitrary ends. Now, the real question then is when is a market free? Is Rosa Martinez free if you can hire her for 33 cents an hour? If you take Friedman's definition at face value, then the answer is yes, right? Her decision to take a job making clothes for American markets would presumably be both informed and voluntary, provided she was not deceived about the kind of work she would be doing or the amount that she would be paid. Presumably, no one would force her to take the job, and no one would prevent her from leaving it. So both Rosa Martinez and her employer would enter into this exchange in the expectation of benefiting from it. The employer gets uh, low labor costs, and Rosa Martinez gets uh, an improvement over starvation. Now, the problem with this view is that it pretends to be blind to the real disparity of power that exists there while simultaneously stripping away the ability to judge an exchange on the basis of anything but power, right? Since any telos or goal or end or common standard of good has been eliminated from view. Nothing necessarily connects the employer's desires to Rosa Martinez's desire. In Friedman's view, to ask if this exchange serves the common good or if it's just is irrelevant to the question of whether or not the exchange is free. We may only ask if each party is entering into the exchange expecting to gain something for their own individual interests that they would not have gained if they hadn't entered into the exchange. Now, some free market advocates may wish to argue, on the other hand, that the exchange with Rosa Martinez is, is not free but an aberration in the free market system that will work itself out if the market mechanism is given time to operate. But in, even in that case, in order to judge which exchanges are truly free and which are not, we have to abandon Friedman's purely negative approach to freedom and have some positive standard by which to judge. For example, if we admit that Rosa Martinez's exchange with her employer is voluntary and informed, and yet we still want to claim it's not truly free, we have to be able to muster an argument based on some standard of human flourishing and the ends of human life that's being violated by her working for less than a living wage. In other words, once we admit that freedom, defined strictly negatively, is inadequate, then we're pushed toward the recognition that Augustine and not Friedman was right. To speak of freedom in any realistic and full sense is necessarily to engage the question of the true ends of human life. Yet such ends are precisely what free market advocates would banish from the definition of the free market. So to enter into judgments about the freedom of particular exchanges, we must abandon freedom's, Friedman's definition of a free market and also abandon any claims for the goodness or badness of the free market as such. The real question is when is a market free? And for that, we have to have some standard of human flourishing by which to judge it. So the real, the real task is moving beyond the kind of ideology of the free market as such which is oftentimes just an empty slogan to make us feel good about the hegemony of corporate power. The real task is judging particular practices in terms of the ends of human life, particular judgments about what practices are freeing and what aren't. And let me give you just uh, briefly then two examples of how this might work. Um, New York Times reporter Bob Herbert visited a factory in El Salvador that made clothing for Liz Claiborne. The jackets sell for $178 a piece. 
in the U.S. and the workers who make them earn 70 cents per, 77 cents per jacket. So $178 are sold for, and the women who make them start to finish make 77 cents uh, per jacket. The, va the factory is surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards. A worker interviewed after her 12-hour shift told of being unable to feed herself and her three-year-old daughter adequately. Her daughter drinks coffee because they can't afford milk. Both mother and daughter suffer fainting spells. The president of the um, company that runs the plant admitted to Herbert that the wages are inadequate. He said, if you really ask me, this is not fair. But he then offered a lesson in free trade by saying, quote, in the United States, if you want to buy a Honda Civic, you can shop around and you'll always find cheaper ones. And that, he said, is what his company was doing. We're shopping around the whole world for the cheapest labor price. And that's just the way it is. Now, contrast this with the Mondragon Corporation in Spain. It's a $3 billion corporation. It employs 60,000 people in Spain. And it was founded by a Basque priest named Jose Maria Arismendi, Arismendiarieta in 1956. And it's based on the ideas that he got from G.K. Chesterton and others, uh, distributism, which is the idea that a just social order can only be achieved through just distribution of property and a recognition of the dignity of labor. So Mondragon is entirely worker-owned and worker-governed based on a system of one vote, vote per worker. At Mondragon, they believe that labor hires capital instead of capital hiring labor. labor. Their capital comes largely from a worker and community-supported credit union. The highest paid employee can make no more than six times the lowest paid. 10% of surpluses are given directly to community development projects. Not only is the company successful and laborers highly satisfied with their work, but the communities in which Mondragon operates have lower crime rates, lower rates of domestic violence, higher rates of education, and better physical and emotional health than other neighboring communities. Now, by Friedman's standards, the Salvadoran worker and the worker at Mondragon are free. I'm sorry, the Guatemalan worker and the worker at Mondragon are free. But if we allow ourselves to judge freedom on the basis of the true ends of human life, it becomes obvious that the Guatemalan woman is little better than enslaved and the Mondragon worker is afforded the opportunity for true freedom. Freedom is not just an empty slogan in that way. It's, Mondragon is founded on the recognition that true freedom requires careful consideration of what is required for human flourishing, which requires consideration of the ends of human being, and it can be done in the kind of economy that we have. Mondragon is proof of that, and that's why I wanted to bring that forward. This is not utopian, and it doesn't require a communist society or a socialist society or something. It just requires people making spaces of truly free economies. So the link between property and freedom in this sense is a crucial one. Um, people aren't free unless they can become owners of, of some of the means of production. One more example uh, I'm going to give, this time um, having to do with consumption. When you buy a steak in a large chain grocery store, according to Friedman, all the information one needs to make a free decision is conveyed by the price, as long as the steak is of sufficient quality. All the information you need is conveyed by the price. But what we don't see is the conditions under which it was produced. A calf in a cattle feedlot might spend the first few months of life eating grass on the range, but typically the rest of its short life is spent in a feedlot, ankle deep in manure. By nature, cattle are equipped to turn grass that grows naturally on arid land into high quality protein to let cattle graze those considered inefficient these days because it takes longer. So cattle go from 80 to 1200 pounds in just 14 months on a crash diet of corn, protein supplements, and drugs. They're given hormone implants, which are banned in Europe but not in the US, to promote growth. Their calories come from corn, which is cheap and convenient, but depends on the use of lots of petroleum products. The only way to keep cattle from dying of bloating, acidosis, and abscessed livers on a grain diet, which is not natural to them, is to give them steady doses of antibiotics. 
and still many strains of bacteria survive, we used to be able to count on the fact that such bacteria raised in a cow's neutral pH digestive tract would be killed off by the acids in the human stomach, but now that the cow's digestive tract has been acidified by a corn diet, acid-tolerant strains like E. coli have developed that when found in our food can kill us. When the cattle are slaughtered, they are caked with feedlot manure. Rather than alter their diet or keep them from living in their own feces or slowing down the processing speed at the slaughter lines, which are all considered inefficient and impractical, the meat is sprayed with disinfectant solution and irradiated, then it's shrink-wrapped and sent to your local supermarket. Is everybody hungry now? <laughs> Each head of cattle, by the way, requires about 284 gallons of oil in its lifetime if it's fed on corn. As Michael Pollan says, we have succeeded in industrializing the beef calf, transforming what was once a solar-powered ruminant into the very last thing we need, another fossil fuel machine. I'm not done yet, by the way. Runoff from the petroleum-based fertilizer has traveled down the Mississippi and created a 12,000-mile dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which has since uh, been covered with a slick of oil from the BP oil spill, by the way. Extensive use of antibiotics has led to resistant strains of bacteria, etc. One cattleman interviewed by Pollen commented, I'd love to give up hormones. If the consumer said we don't want hormones, we'd stop in a second. The cattle could get along better without them, but the market signal's not there, and as long as my competitor's doing it, I've got to do it too. Against, again, this sense of, I'd like to act otherwise, but I can't, right? Of being coerced by the free market in that way. Contrast this with the Zweber farm in Elko, Minnesota, where until we recently moved to Chicago, we bought beef from John and Lisa's Weber. Um, it's grass-fed. It's raised on the pasture land behind their house. They use no hormones or antibiotics. When I buy beef from the Zwebers, it's a free exchange in every sense of the word. Right? All the information I need is available and transparent, and most importantly, it can, the, the transaction contributes to the flourishing of me, my family, the Zwebers, their community, the environment, and so on. My exchange at the supermarket, I'm arguing, is not free. It's less than free, less than fully free. The information I need is not available to me. I can't tell where it came from. It just appeared on the shelves, and I don't know um, uh, the, the provenance of it, and um, the ranchers and the feedlot workers chafe under the compulsion of market forces beyond, our control, beyond their control. Okay, so finally then, am I calling for state intervention in the market? No, I think it's a false dichotomy to limit the possibilities to either requiring state intervention or blessing the unfettered reign of corporate power. I'm not really crazy about either state or corporation, and, and for the most part, they work together anyway. Neither state intervention nor its absence ensures the freedom of a market. There's no point to making broad utilitarian claims about the benefits of the free market, as if we could identify a market as free by the mere absence of restraint on naked power. Giving rein to power without ends is more likely to produce unfreedom than to produce freedom. There is simply no way to talk about a really free economy without entering into particular judgments about what kinds of exchange are conducive to the flourishing of life on earth and what kinds are not. So you have to read labels and find out about things and try to make each exchange as free as it possibly can. Um, it's exhausting, but it's liberating. There's something, uh, Wendell Berry has a wonderful article called um, The Joy of Sales Resistance. And uh, there's something wonderful about driving past the Walmart and extending your middle finger and salute. <laughs> um, so my purpose in this talk has not been to go into detail about the specific ends of human work and material possession. I think the Christian tradition has a wealth of resources for reflection on these matters. Um, and other traditions have resources as well. But I think it would be counterproductive to expect the state 
to attempt to impose such a direction on economic activity. What's most important is the direct embodiment of free economic practices. So um, from a Christian point of view, I think the churches need to take an active role in fostering economic practices that are consonant with the true ends of creation. And this requires promoting economic practices that maintain close connections among capital, labor, and community so that real communal discernment of the good can take place. And such are spaces in which true freedom can flourish. Um, one example of that, my church in St. Paul, Minnesota, was part of a cooperative of small family farmers that marketed through churches uh, in the, the Twin Cities. And there you find kind of um, real uh, exchanges where um, something other than just uh, prices, um, uh, but a real consideration of what benefits all involved. Um, was was evident, and so I think um, those are the kinds of spaces in which true freedom can flourish. Thank you. We are having a uh, opportunity on Saturday morning for more extended dialogue with Bill on the themes that he's been covering in the lectures, but we thought we'd just give a few moments for one or two questions this evening. If anybody knows they're not going to be there on Saturday and wants to ask questions, just a, just a few. Um, yeah, I have to confess that I haven't really read Amartya Sen. I know that I, I'm supposed to, and I, I guess I ought to. Um, but yeah, no, I, from what I understand, he's very much uh, on the same track. He doesn't, um, I think, provide um, uh, as much of a kind of um, uh, uh, tradition-based uh, reflection on what the actual goods um, of uh, people are, but he does try to provide a kind of general consensus on what um, uh, what uh, leads towards uh, human flourishing, and I think that's very much kind of on on the right track. And I think um, individual uh, traditions, people that are invested in in specific traditions, need to mine those traditions for the sorts of resources to create um, different kinds of economies that. Um, that uh, th that bear out what what we in fact think uh, freedom uh, is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good question. Um, I, I probably overstated my case uh, in the talk. I don't think I would want to say that there's no role for the state uh, in the immediate um, uh, um, uh, situation or in the immediate aftermath of the kinds of things that we saw, the, you know, the meltdown in 2008. Um, I tend to be kind of an anarchist when uh, it comes to these sorts of matters. I, I've developed critiques uh, of um, the state and, um, and I think in some circ I, I think we need to be wary of state involvement, but I think in, in the short term, uh, there are times in which state intervention is the lesser of, of two evils. Um, but here's why I'm suspicious of state intervention, because I don't think that the state and the corporation are really two different things anymore. Um, the, the dialogue, the political dialogue in the United States, and I don't know how it goes here in New Zealand, I've only been here for 48 hours, but in the United States, Democrats say, um, 
let's rely on the state and Republicans say let's rely on the corporation and there's this false sort of debate that goes on because what nobody acknowledges is the fact that the state and the corporation are deeply intertwined and that's what we saw in the aftermath of the economic crisis in 2008 was the government um, stepping in and uh, bailing out the, the corporations that, and the banks that were too big uh, to fail. That's just one example of, of countless examples of corporate welfare um, and, and the, the deep inter, intertwining of corporate and state power. There are times at which the state um, can protect people and does protect people against the depredations of corporate power, um, but they tend to be few and far between, at least in my uh, context. And so um, in general, uh, I mean, Wendell Berry has some interesting thoughts on this, and he says that, that the way we tend to view um, all of uh, social life is, is we delegate it to others. Um, we delegate education and health care and uh, protection and so on to um, to others, the state and so on. And there's um, there's a sense in which a true politics, which is something that takes place on a face-to-face -face level, uh, is is simply lost uh, in, in there. So I tend to be kind of uh, along the lines of Wendell Berry or Dorothy Day um, uh, on uh, on these matters. That the goal, the real goal, is uh, to return. Uh, politics and economy to uh, a human scale. Yeah. But th thanks, that was an excellent question. Yeah. Right. Um, so the question was, how do you do that? Um, in my book, Being Consumed, I give uh, example after example. I try to be very concrete about that and give many examples of that. Uh, one of the examples is uh, uh, the whole farm co-op that I just referred to in which um, uh, a number of churches have contracted with a cooperative of family farmers and have subverted the, the, the kind of larger process of supply and demand um, where the buyer is trying to get the price down as low as possible and the seller is trying to get the price as high as possible. And instead they meet in a kind of community and say, what's a just price, right? This is the way that it worked ideally in the medieval uh, era. I found this wonderful. Um, I stayed uh, with my godparents um, a few years back and discovered um, an old Catholic school geography textbook from 1952 in the bedroom that I stayed at. And um, it was called World Neighbors, and the section on e economics is just wonderful. The section on economics um, talks about um, how in the Middle Ages, people set the price based on the just price, but today it says indignantly, people think that prices ought to be set by supply and demand and that you could beat down the seller to as low as prices you can get and so on, and that this just isn't justice. And the wonderful thing about this is not just the sort of romanticized view of the Middle Ages, but the idea that we were actually teaching this to Catholic grade school children in the 1950s. Now, the, my, my kids go to Catholic grade school and the geography textbooks that they read are exactly the same as the ones that everybody else reads in uh, public school. So there's no, we've lost our imagination of trying to produce a different kind of world. And it requires these acts of imagination. I mean, there's no large scale, I think, um, solution to this question. There can only be small scale st solutions to the question because the scale of it is part of the problem to begin with. And so the only thing I can do is provide these kind of small homey examples of the, the Zwebers and the farmer's markets. I mean, where, where this has really taken off in the United States is this kind of consumer revolt of, of localism, right, um, around the issue of food. And it's one of the most significant kind of consumer revolts um, over the last uh, few decades. And, and it's, it's really significant because it gets at the heart of trying to kind of reclaim a certain sense of freedom and control over 
um, over our economic lives um, that people feel has just simply uh, been lost. And, um, and there's a great sense of joy uh, in this, a tremendous sense of joy of getting to know the farmer and um, eating things that you know where they come from and um, you know, going out to the farm and, and uh, you know, the, our kids got to know the farmer well and, um, and all of this brings a, a sense of joy and connection that is oftentimes uh, lost. Um, but I, d I don't think there's anything else we can do but simply create these sorts of spaces of economic freedom and then hope that they grow and then create more, more of these kinds of spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is out of my area of, all of this is out of my area of expertise, by the way. I'm just, um, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> um, I, when I come, I'm a theologian, and when I come uh, to economics, I'm, a, I'm an amateur. But, um, uh, I mean, when you look at some of the effects of free trade agreements, corn farmers in Mexico, for example, were devastated by the NAFTA agreement, uh, free trade agreement. Um, and, uh, and, and it's interesting the way that the debate got framed in the United States because the debate was always, um, will this be good for America or bad for America? And the problem is that um, it's both good and bad for America. It tends to be good for uh, the owners of capital, and it tends to be bad for the workers. But class, you, you just simply can't talk class anymore. You can only talk national language. If you try to talk class, you're, you're accused of making class warfare, which is kind of like you know, accusing the fire department of setting fires. Right um, when you're when you're trying to put out class warfare and identify it, you're accused of making it. Um, but all of these things, these issues, get framed in these national terms that obscure the really um, uh, close analysis of who the winners and who the losers are going to be um, in these matters. And so you really, in order to 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 judge whether or not this is going to produce freedom, really free trade. Um, you, ha you really have to, to, to look on the ground and see what's, what's this going to do to small farmers in Mexico, for example, when suddenly their market is flooded by cheap industrially produced corn from the United States. And nobody asked that question, few people asked that question, and then it happened and then the Mexican farmers were simply devastated um, by it. Um, and this tends to be the way that these free trade agreements work. There are winners. But there are, are significant numbers uh, of losers. Um, but the, the way the ideology works is it prevents us from asking these real questions about who the winners and the losers are going to be and are. And, um, and we simply need to salute the idea of freedom. Uh,